And it is a privilege for me to invite Caleb Franklin to come forward and share with us the gospel. I do have to say, you know, thinking about his life, you know that he has been here since the beginning of his life. <laughs> All the way. You know what I'm saying? Even those days that he didn't want to be here, he was still here. Praise God. And I believe that the word of the Lord has been sown into his heart. And the Lord has deposited something for us. So pull on the anointing, as Pastor Tim always says. Pull on the anointing that we might receive the fullness thereof. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, thank you so much, Ismail. Um, what a that wasn't me. That wasn't me. We just oh, okay, we'll carry on. Oh, uh, let's pray and we'll dive in. Father, we thank you for who you are. Lord, you've been honored by our worship. Lord, we are honored by your presence. Holy Spirit, we love you. We're thankful for you. We're grateful for you and what you do. We ask that as I speak that, that you would be made real. Lord, you are the waters and we are thirst. And we come before you to drink today. You said, ask of me and I will give you living waters. I will give you a drink and you'll never thirst again. So we come before you saying, here we are. Fill us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Oh, um. While I was in worship, Jay, I felt like the Lord said, if I can deliver the Israelites out of Egypt, I can deliver the Haitian church out of the hand of a gangs. And I felt that so strong. Don't lose hope. When it looks hopeless, don't lose hope. Whew. Anyways. Um... Today I want to talk on the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us, being near to the Holy Spirit. And as I was preparing, one thing that really struck my heart is just the resume of God, what all God has done. In Job chapter, I think it's 36 or 37, God starts questioning Job and he says, Job, did you create the foundations of the earth? Who hangs the foundations? Who created the depths of the oceans? Who told the oceans to go this far and no further? Was it you? Do you make the sunrise come up in the morning? Do you make the sun set at night? And we just see the questions that God starts asking Job, basically just declaring, Job 36, 26, Elihu says to Job, Behold, God is great, and we don't know him. Behold, God is great, and we don't know him. What I want to set before you today is God's resume. If Think right now just to yourself. If God had a resume, what would be on it? Created the earth in six days. Delivered from sin through his son's death. Split 
the waters so that the Israelites could walk through. Stop the sun for Josh. Sent fire from heaven for Elijah. Then you go into to Jesus' life alone. Healing, and you know, multiple times we see it says that, and Jesus healed all who were sick in, in wherever he was at, by Galilee and, and where he was. And what I want to set before you is that we have this resume of who God is on our inside through the Holy Spirit. So you sit here, you look at the Word, you hold this before you, and you read what God has done, how God delivered the Israelites through David with Goliath. We have the fullness of God on our insides through the Holy Spirit. Just take a moment to think about that. The Holy Spirit, the fullness of God. In the beginning, Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2 says, In the beginning, God. Before anything was created, before time was created, God was just there. And the Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the waters. That same Holy Spirit is inside of us because we believe. If you believe in Jesus, you have that same Holy Spirit inside of us. Um, a friend says, we have billions and billions of riches inside of us through the Holy Spirit. But many of us are just living on 20 cents a day. Many of us settle for so much less than what we should. So much less than what we need to. We have all the riches of knowledge and wisdom inside of us, yet we settle for 20 cents. And that's something that I want to set before you to ponder and to change. So we have the resume of God living on our insides. But the only thing that is different, all of us have the same resume. We all have the same Holy Spirit dwelling in us. But the one thing that's different is our history in God. Your history in God looks different than my history. Your history, your story, your pursuit, your highs and your lows look completely different than my highs and my lows. But God has been faithful through your life, through my life, and he's going to continue to be faithful because that's who he is. One, one thing that we can't do is we can't have somebody else's history. You can't have mine and I can't have yours. You can't have my fitness level and I don't know if I want yours. So I'm just saying that there, there, there is history, there is something in God that is different in all of us, and you can't have mine and I can't have yours. One of the things that I look for in a leader to be above me is, what is your prayer life? Do I want your prayer life? And if I don't, then do I really want to sit under you? If I do want you prayer, your prayer life, then yes. I want to sit under you, and I want to ask those questions that the disciples asked. They sat under Jesus, and at the end of the day, they didn't ask about miracles. They didn't ask about how to disciple people. They didn't ask about how to heal people. They asked, teach us to pray. Right? There is something about the Lord that they connected his reality and who he is with the Father with prayer, with proximity to Jesus. Does, would in an Olympic or an, an athlete who's trying to get to the Olympics, they're not going to go to Subway and ask the person behind the counter to be their coach, right? They're going to go find somebody who's been in the Olympics. They're going to go find a proven track record of a coach, and they're going to go to them and say, train me, help me, give me advice. They're not going to Subway or Jersey Mike's or wherever else asking any Joe Schmo to coach them. And so I set before you with this resume of the Holy Spirit inside of us, who are you going to to ask for stability in your life? Are you going to the Holy Spirit or are you going to friends? Oftentimes, we like to go to our friends to vent, to ask them for help. Hey, would you pray for me? That's great. I love that. I have prayer partners. I have accountability partners. I go to friends, but that's not my first drink that I drink from. We go to the Lord. We ask Holy Spirit, what do you have? One of my favorite things and things I love about one of my good friends, Jason, who they just had a baby. Congratulations, Jason. We love you. Um, but one of my favorite things about him is when I talk with him, he's like, hey, this is what I went to the Holy Spirit, and this is what I feel like he's saying. I'm like, then why are you asking me A, B, and C? He's like, well, I just want to talk through it with you. And I'm like, okay, like the Lord's already given answers. And it's provoked my heart to be like, hey, before I go to him or someone else 
and ask them, what's Holy Spirit saying to me about a situation? And so I set that before you, is that in the times we're living in, right, we have um, all the attacks that came against Israel. We have crazy political situations. The earth as a whole is groaning. The earth as a whole is shaking. All of foundations are shaking across the globe in believers, in Christians, in non-Christians. Things are being shook, right? The things are being exposed. We're coming into seasons of shaking, of, of exposure, and times of being rattled that are set before us. We're just in the beginnings, right? We, I can even look back you know, 10, 15 years and see the depravity of humanity and where things are going, but also see the goodness of God and where those things are going. And at right now, it's as easy as it's going to get, okay? Today is as easy as it's going to get. And so we need the Holy Spirit. And my, my plea and my words that I set before you is that our relationship and what we've cultivated on the inside of us is what we have. It's what is going to be shown. I'm not talking about just having a bad day, but I'm talking about after you have the bad day, after you have tears, after you've gone through seasons, weeks, days, months of trials, what do you have on the inside? Where is your heart? Have you lost hope or do you feel more hopeful? Have you lost faith or have you fed on his faithfulness to get you through the situation? Hang in there. Everything will be exposed for the good. What we bring to the table isn't going to keep us. What we bring to the table isn't what sustains us. And, and I want to kind of just set that pres- precedent through reading through John chapter 13. So if you have your Bible or your phone, just open it up. John 13, verse 8. This is where I see that statement of what we bring to the table doesn't sustain us. It doesn't keep us. In John 13, verse 8, Peter said, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him and said, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. (laughs) You know, I think all of us are like Peter in ways, sometimes more of us than others. But like, I look at at Peter and he's like, Lord, you're not washing my feet. Do you know who I am, where I've been? No, 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 no. Like, you are my rabbi. You're my teacher. You're not washing my feet. And he's like, Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And he's like, okay, then just dunk me under. Grab the bucket and wash all of me because that's how committed I am to you. That's who I am. I am yours, Jesus. Through and through, this is who I am. So Peter is basically saying to Jesus, I'm the most devoted to you. And we'll see it again in just a moment. But at the same time, Peter exposes his biggest fear. In that same statement, Peter's biggest fear is being at an arm's length, being at a distance from Jesus. Because he said, Jesus said, you have, if, if I don't, you have no part with me. And that's Peter's biggest fear, is being at a distance from Jesus. Because of his next response, then wash all of me. Because I don't want to be far from you. I want to be near you. So we read on. Uh, verse 11. For he, knew, for he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garment, and sat down, again he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, "For well, for so I am. And if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example. And I'm just going to kind of skip through this. Verse 18, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scriptures may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you, before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. And when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in his spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. 
Now, therefore, leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved, Simon Peter, therefore motioned to him, asked who it was of whom he spoke. Then, leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. So on and so forth. We know that Jesus dips the bread in the cup, gives it to Judas. Judas leaves to go do his thing. And the disciples thought that Jesus told Judas to go do something with the money box, to go do something, right? And we skip kind of on, and we get to verse um, 34 in John 13. It says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Then Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I'll lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Question, most assuredly I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. So here we go. We see Peter's biggest fear again, saying, Jesus, where are you going that I can't be with you? So Peter is bringing his fear and exposing himself in the midst of asking the question, hey, Jesus, I want to be near you. Where are you going? I'm going to follow you. I'm, I'm committed to you. I'm the most devoted to you. I'm going to lay down my life for you. So right here, Peter is bringing his devotion to Jesus. And it gets exposed. If we jump over to Luke 21, you guys don't have to turn there, but I'll just turn there and read it to you. In the same scene, Luke records something that John doesn't record. In the same time frame. Okay? Okay. In Luke 22, verse 31, says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. And he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you deny me three times. Right? So we have the same exact story. We have John's version of the story. John just explained this. And then we have Luke explaining this story. But Luke says, oh, hey, I remember what happened. I remember what was said. And Luke adds a little bit more detail than what John adds. And Luke adds this. Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you. As I was kind of reading through and studying this, um, I want to bring before you that John 13 through 17 is just the last few days before Jesus is crucified, right? On Monday and Tuesday of the week was the Olivet Discourse, which is Matthew 24 and 25. And in that discourse, Jesus talks about troubling times that are going to come, persecutions. And he gives a parable of the ten virgins, right? That five have oil in their lamps and they five carry extra. And the other five did not carry extra oil. One thing that hit me recently over the last two weeks is that, do you realize that the five virgins, this is a freebie, so just take it and study it on your own. But do you realize that the five virgins who did not have extra oil, That they weren't concerned about seeing the bridegroom? What were they concerned about? That they their lamp would go out. Right? How often are we concerned if our lamps go out, not really the noticing the bigger issue of missing the bridegroom? And I know this parable is is deeper and bigger than that, but what I want to present to you guys is. Maybe in everyday life, if we don't focus just on our lamp, but realize the bigger issue is, am I missing Holy Spirit coming today, right? What am I missing today that the Holy Spirit wants to do? Maybe he wants to speak through you to someone. Maybe he wants to give an encouraging word through someone. But if we're too busy going about our day, what if, you know, I got to finish work and pick up kids from school and make dinner and do this and teething baby and whatever else 
but we don't stop to focus on our bridegroom, Jesus, right? If we don't stop to focus on the Holy Spirit inside of us, we might miss something. So that's the freebie. Um, so Monday, Tuesday, Jesus gives the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, 25. Skip Wednesday. Now we're into Thursday, right? Friday morning is when Jesus, or Friday is when Jesus starts the um, crucifixion. But on Thursday, Jesus is John chapter 13 through 17. Jesus' last words to the disciples. So that's part of why I'm focusing on this, because if it was your last week before you were to die, would it change what you say? Would it change who you talk to? Would it change who you go to and what you say and, and what you focus on? And in this last words of Jesus, he focuses on his disciples. He focuses on the Holy Spirit. He focuses on being connected to the Father. So let me jump back here to Luke 22. This is the same last day before Jesus is crucified. And he says, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. As, as I was studying that word, I have or excuse me, let me step back. That word sifted means to pick apart. So it's saying Satan has asked that he could pick you apart, that he could break you down, that he could tear you down, break you down, pull you apart, expose everything inside of you, and to bring you to nothing, right? But he says, but I have prayed for you. And that's what I want to focus on. But I have. That word I have means I've bound myself to you. So Jesus is conveying to Peter, hey, Peter's asked to sift you. He's asked, asked to pick you apart. Have you ever felt picked apart? I mean, I just went through two weeks of teething. And I'll tell you what, it will bring you to your knees wondering if you're saved. I felt picked apart. You know, you're, you get a couple hours of sleep a night. You just get the baby back down. You shut the door. You turn around. You walk out. You sit down on the couch at 11 o'clock at night, and you're like, oh, I'm exhausted. I need to try to get some sleep before she wakes up again. And before you can get to your bedroom door, you hear, Meh. and you're like, oh, Lord, please. You know, teething can pick you apart. But more than teething babies is that Satan himself wanted to pick Peter apart. And Jesus said, don't worry. You know, I can only imagine Peter looking at Jesus and being like, but you told him no, right? You know, you told Satan he can't pick me apart. And Jesus is like, no, I didn't. He's like, but don't worry. I've bound myself to you. I've tied myself to you. I get the imagery in my own head of this, of like, think of a three-legged race. You all remember those? I don't even know if people do these anymore. But you have two people standing side by side. You put your leg out. The other person puts their leg out. You hang on for dear life. And someone ties your legs together, and you have to run for all it's worth to the finish line. I, I get that picture of that's what Jesus did. He's bound himself to us. He's tied himself to us, Right? And that's what he said. He said, I've bound myself to you. And that word you is plural. It's not a one-time thing. He's not saying, hey, Peter, don't worry for this one instance. I got you. It's plural. It means I'm going to have you. I've got you now. I've got you tomorrow. I've got you the next day. I'm with you. I'm not leaving you, right? So Jesus has bound himself to us. Let me jump back here to, to John. So, Jesus knew Peter was going to fail him. And even though he knew Peter was going to fail him, he already helped restore him. He said, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Before Peter even denied Jesus three times, Jesus already came to him to strengthen him, right? To help him. What in your life or times in your life, before you failed, can you look back? And realize before your failure or your mess up or your whatever, did you get a word from the Lord that he strengthened you ahead of time? But you missed it until afterwards? 
That, so just something to think on and ponder. So I'm, I'm convinced more now than ever that it's not about my devotion. It's not about what I can bring to the Lord. Being in my early 20s, coming out of Bible school, I was like, okay, what things am I going to do for God? I have a thousand prophetic words over the decades that I've received from every prophet who's come into this church that I've received from other churches and other places. And it only, honestly frustrated me more than helped me because I'm like trying to figure out how these prophetic words are going to happen and line up. And then I start look, looking at like, what do I bring to the table to make things happen? And even just like Peter, Peter brought his devotion to Jesus saying, I'm going to go with you to the end. I'm going to die for you. In my same way, I brought all my devotion, all my merits, everything that I had, I brought before the Lord and I set before him, hey, Lord, this is how I live my life, walking before you in holiness and purity through my teenage years, going to Bible school, A, B, and C. Look at all I've done for you, Lord. Now, what are you going to do with me, right? But I'm convinced it has nothing to do with what I've brought to him over the years. It has everything to do with who he is and who he's given us. Right? So if we start changing our perspective to how, you know, Lord, I've served you. I've done this. I feel like I've made the right choices. Why is A, B, and C happening? Why hasn't A, B, and C happened? Change your perspective. Forget about what you bring to the table. Put your hand on your stomach and on your spirit and just wait for a second and pause and ask Holy Spirit, what are you doing? What do you want to do? And that's the perspective shift for me. Is It's not about what I've brought to the table. It's that he's prayed for me. Right? So we see this in Hebrews 7.25. It says he is living to make intercession. Therefore, he who is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he has always lived to make intercession for them. The church in Haiti is going to flourish and come out shining bright because he prays for them. Not because that they show up to a church service or a prayer meeting. It's because he's faithful to the church in Haiti. We're going to shine bright, and we're going to touch Brevard County, and the church in Melbourne and Titusville and Palm Bay is going to shine, and people are going to come to the knowledge and the glory of God, and God is going to be worshipped. Why? Because he prays for us. Because he's given the Holy Spirit to us. He's shown up Sunday after Sunday for decades. Not because we're faithful to serve. It's because God's faithful to us. He's faithful. It says Jude one twenty four. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I don't know if I've ever tasted exceeding joy, but I want to. Right? I don't know what that looks like, but I want it. But Jesus is faithful. The Holy Spirit is faithful. He's the one that keeps you from stumbling. He's the one that will hold you. He's the one that keeps you. And he's the one that will guard you and help you. Like I said earlier, troubling days are ahead. And it's going to expose our grocery list that we bring to the Lord. Right? If we only bring to the Lord in our prayer time, our list of to-dos, and helps and change this, then we're going to be disappointed. Not because he won't answer those. He loves us and he will answer those things. And he is faithful to do those things, right? He, he'll give you and do more for you than you can possibly think or imagine. But if we're coming to him in a narcissistic way just to be filled, we're missing it, right? We can be Christian narcissists before the Lord. We can come to him just to be filled. Lord, fill me because you're a pleasure and I need help. Lord, fill me for me. I need you. Well, that's great, and I love that. I love that he fills, right? I, I said from the beginning of service, service, we are thirst 
and he is the fountain. That's what it says in Jeremiah. If he's the fountain, then we come to him for him to fill us. But more than that, we come to him because he's worthy and he deserves worship and honor and praise. And that's why we come to him. And we ask him to fill us so that we can turn around to pour it back on him. Does that make sense? So, don't just come to him with your list, but come to him because we want him and we need him. Jesus spoke with his mouth. He didn't just think things, he spoke things, right? When he was tempted in the wilderness, he said, it is written. He spoke the word. You know the Holy Spirit's favorite vehicle or motorcycle to drive on is the Word. You want to get the Holy Spirit, go to the Word. Find a Bible verse and start quoting it, start thinking on it, start meditating it, start reading it, sing it, pray it, write it, read it. That's what will start shifting things in your heart. Pick one verse and just hang on it, and the Holy Spirit will come because that's his vehicle. Corey Russell makes this statement. It says, you can yell at devils all day, but unless you're being conformed to the image of Jesus, your shout has no clout. If you don't know what clout is, clout is just power. So yell at devils all day long. Rebuke whatever you want to do. But unless you're being conformed to the likeness of Jesus, your shout has no muscle behind it. It has no power behind it. Right? Right? Jesus had power, and it is written because he was the word. He was the father in the flesh, right? So you take your scripture, and you plug into the Holy Spirit, and you use that word, and there will be power behind your punch. There will be power behind your shout. There will be freedom that gets brought to you. There will be joy that will fill you, and the Holy Spirit will come. The disciples, like I said, they saw Jesus. They walked with him. For three years, they were with him. They had the best time of being with Jesus. For three years, they walked with him. And what did they ask? They asked for his prayer life. They realized that Jesus withdrew, right? So many times in Scripture we see in Jesus withdrew to go and pray. He withdrew from the crowds to go be with his Father. He withdrew, and sometimes when he would withdraw, he would take a couple of the disciples with him. He would take James, Peter, and John with him to where he went and prayed, right? Peter got to see the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus revealed his glory and got to talk with Moses and Elijah, Peter saw that with his eyes. So they had proximity. They had the presence, and they realized that was the thing that shifted, and that's the thing that changed, is that Jesus had proximity to the Father. And my message today is titled, The Holy Spirit in Us, and I'm just getting to this point. So I kind of spent most of my time setting the precedent And I'm going to just burn through real quick what the Holy Spirit is and what he does. So just hang on there. The Holy Spirit will never leave us. He dwells in us. John 14, 17. In John 14, 17, he says, The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. What does dwell mean? He's made his home in you. If you believe in Jesus, the God of Genesis 1-2 who hovered over the waters has made his home inside of you. Right? Your next bad day this week, because it's probably going to happen, Or your next frustrating time in traffic, because we live in Melbourne. I live on near 192. I do everything I can to avoid 192. I hate the road. I hate the traffic. I hate the construction. I can't stand it, right? But in the midst of that frustration, I have Genesis 1-2 living on my inside. And I can say, you are patience. Fill me, right? 
So for you guys, you have the Holy Spirit. He's taken up residence. You have a squatter who lives inside of you because you said yes to Jesus, who's never leaving, who's never being evicted. He's with you. You're stuck with him. You're stuck with the roommate, whether you like him or not. You might not like what he says to you. You might not like how he cleans your house, but he's going to do it because that's who he is, right? One of my favorite things that I pray all the time, and I don't mean this in a snarky way, is I say, Holy Spirit, do your job, right? And I don't mean that in a slight to him, like in a rude way, like do your job, like you're being lazy. I mean it because the Holy Spirit loves to do his job, right? Jesus said it's to your advantage that I go so that the Holy Spirit can come and he will reveal all things to you. And and this Sunday and next Sunday, I'm talking on the Holy Spirit as well, and we're going to go into it even deeper. But I'm going to just hit on a few things of who the Spirit is and what he does. So John 14, 23 says, And Jesus said to them, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And he will come to him, and we will make our home with him. There it is again. He'll dwell in you, and he makes his home in you. He lives inside of us. So often we forget that. We just go about life being like, thank you, Jesus, you died on the cross, and I'm so thankful for that. But it's to my advantage that Jesus left. Why? Why did Jesus say that to the disciples? Because guess what? If the disciples were not with Jesus, they couldn't hear him. Right? When Jesus was with Peter, James, and John praying in the garden, and the other disciples were somewhere else, they didn't hear Jesus. They didn't hear him pray. They weren't with him. But now that we have Holy Spirit, he's like, I'm going to talk to all of you all across the world at once. And I can say the same thing. And that's why in Revelation At the end of it, the whole church in one voice, we can say, the spirit and the bride say, come. Come, Lord Jesus. We're longing for you. That's why. It's because we have the Holy Spirit. So, he makes our home in us. The Holy Spirit does. He's our helper, John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I have said. So we have a helper. We have someone who lives inside us, and we have someone who helps us. John 14, 26 says he is the teacher. John 15, 26 says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from me, he will testify of me. So we have a Helper, we have a Teacher, and we have the truth himself. He's going to reveal Jesus. The Holy Spirit is going to reveal Jesus. John 16, 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for I do not go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So many times we see helper, helper. What was Jesus hinting at? Jesus helped the disciples for the last three years. He helped them to see who the Father is. And he said, guess what, guys, I'm going away. And they didn't really understand it even still, right? But they knew afterwards when they saw Jesus die and he rose again, and we'll get more to that in a minute. But anyways, John 16, 14, it says, he will glorify me, meaning the Holy Spirit. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit takes what's from God, and he will reveal it to you. One of my favorite things to pray is, Holy Spirit, what is the Father saying? Tell me what the Father's saying, right? Even on Friday night, we had the best family prayer and praise time, all eyes on Jesus, like Ismail brought up. Before it even started at 6, God's presence dropped like a bomb at 5.30. We could have just sat in a circle up front and been fine. His presence fell. And while we were in prayer, with all eyes focused on Jesus, I kept saying to myself, Holy Spirit, tell me what the Father's saying. Holy Spirit, what do you hear? What are you hearing? 
What are you hearing from the Father? What are you hearing from Jesus? Bring me into that secret. Bring me into that revelation. I want to know. I want to hear those things. So that's what I start, keep asking the Lord. He will declare secrets to you. Start asking for the secrets. 2 Timothy 1.14 says that the Holy Spirit will guard or keep the words that have been spoken to you. So the Holy Spirit's our helper. He's our teacher. He's our comforter. He's the one who will reveal Jesus. He reveals the Father. This is who the Holy Spirit is. That's what I'm talking about. Who lives inside of us is who I'm talking about. Okay? The fullness of God living on our insides, the billions of dollars, the wealth of all wisdom, knowledge, and riches that's living inside of us is who I'm talking about. He will reveal the Father, and He will glorify Jesus. And in John 16, it says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. And in the world you are going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've already overcome the world. Jesus already knows the end from the beginning. The Holy Spirit is not intimidated by tomorrow. He's not intimidated by Iran and Israel and what's going on. He knows it. And he already has overcome everything. He's already conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave, right? And there's one person who's seated on the throne, and that is Jesus. And the Holy Spirit testifies of Jesus and reveals Jesus in us and through us. It's up to us to say, what are you speaking? What are you saying? And what are you hearing? Some of us need to take an account. Some of us need to just step back and say, clear the table. Who cares what you've done over the last 30 years in ministry? Throw it to the side. Take an account and say, Jesus, you bring to the table what I need. You bring to the table what I need. You are faithful. David said, if it had not been for your faithfulness, I would have died in my afflictions. It's not what we bring to the table. It's what he brings to the table. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So I can't have a mic attached to my face. You guys will hear all the messy. It's not about what we bring. You know, you can fall into bitterness or offense to the Lord if you're focused on what you bring in, in to Him and miss that you only love the Lord and you only have a yes to the Lord and you're only sitting in this room right now because he's prayed for you and he's helped you. That's the only reason why you're still here. It's the only reason why you're still faithful to the Lord is because he's prayed for you. He makes intercession before you. He's sitting next to the Father and he's saying, Lord, help them. Give him strength. Help him. It's not about me and what I've done and I've been faithful for 24 years or 34 years to the Lord. It's because he's prayed for me. If it wasn't for him, I'd be off the deep end, right? Some of us need to take an account. We need to ask ourselves, am I making room for Holy Spirit? Am I paying attention to who he is inside of us? Do I care about what he says? I challenge you guys this week to sit before the Lord and in your quiet time, 
leave your prayer list. Put it in your Bible. Put business as usual and how you come to the Lord every day and put it to the side and just pause and wait on the Lord in quiet, right? It says if you wait on the Lord, he will renew your strength. If you wait on the Lord and you're silent, he will fight for you. If you wait on the Lord and on the Holy Spirit, he will speak to you and listen to what he has to say. We need to listen more than we speak. We need to ask what he has to say and then shut up. Put our grocery list to the side and say, speak to me. And then actually give him time to listen. And before our mind goes in a thousand other directions, bring it back. Whatever, shake it off. What are you saying? You said you speak to me. You said you're the revealer of truth. Freely you have given all things to me, Holy Spirit. So I wait on you. Declare to me the secrets of what Jesus is doing. Tell me about the Father. It's one of my favorite prayers. Holy Spirit, tell me about the Father. You know, you can read the Word all day, and like I said, I love the Word. And the Holy Spirit rides on the Word. But if you read the word and fail to commune with him, you're going to be dead as a doornail, right? You're going to be drier than a loaf of bread that sat out to become a crouton. Jesus said that you Pharisees, speaking to the Pharisees, to the religious ones, he said, you search the word for in them you think you have eternal life, but you failed to come to me that you might have life. It's the word and communion and presence and the Holy Spirit together that satisfies us, that fills us, that washes us. You have to bring this word and you have to talk to the Lord over it. You have to meditate. And I'm going to talk a little bit on that next week. But you have to bring the word to him and bring yourself to him. Draw near. Like I said, just... Stop business as usual. Say, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? Speak to me. Wait. Give him time to talk. Then come back to the word. Read a few scriptures. Whatever he says to you, focus on it. And then go back to meditating on those things and talking to the Holy Spirit. Don't just rely only on the word without relying on communing with Holy Spirit without noticing who's inside of you. Jesus was committed to seeing the disciples through. He said, Peter, I've prayed for you. I've bound myself to you. And I'm going to continue to bind myself to you. He's committed to seeing us through, and that's why he sent the Holy Spirit. That's why he put the fullness of God inside of us. Worship team, if you want to come up. Let's just all stand and just close our eyes. The Holy Spirit's already here. He was here during worship. He still is here. And to those who believe, you've received the Holy Spirit. He's already inside of you. You don't have to do anything to earn the Holy Spirit. You just receive Jesus and the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. And John 20 says that that Jesus breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And that's when they were born again. That's when they became that new creation and then had the Holy Spirit inside of them. But isn't it interesting that even though they had the fullness of Holy Spirit, they received Holy Spirit just like you guys have. But 10 days later is when the Holy Spirit fell upon them. There's a difference. We all have the Holy Spirit in us, right? But we need the Holy Spirit upon us. And that's what I'm going to talk about and focus on next week. You'll have to come back to hear 
more on that. But let's just take a second. Let's just close our eyes. Put one hand on your stomach. That's what I like to do. Holy Spirit, you're in there. You're in the depths in there. John 4 says that inside of you is a spring of living water. John 7 says that inside of you is a river of living water. God, I ask right now for springs to be be turned into rivers. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would deepen in all those in this room today, this week. Holy Spirit, that as we go about this week, we wouldn't lose focus on who you are, but we would start asking you, talking to you, realizing that we have billions and billions and billions of riches inside of us and that we're not satisfied with living on the 20 cents we have been. We want more. Holy Spirit, we want more. Father, I love the gifts that you've given through the Holy Spirit. I love the gifts. I love prophecy. I love healings and signs and wonders and miracles. But what I love more is when you speak to me, when you reveal Jesus to me. So I ask right now, reveal Jesus, Holy Spirit. Do what you love to do. Do your job, Holy Spirit, this week. Reveal Jesus to us. Reveal the Father. Tell us the secrets. Declare it to us this week. Help us to stop busying ourselves and to focus on who's inside of us. Give us a reset. Father, we need a reboot. We need a reboot, Lord. Change our operating system. Give us upgrade 17.4. Give us a 17.5, Holy Spirit. Some of you in here have, may have felt sifted. You may have felt picked apart or are feeling picked apart. If that's you, just raise your hand. If you see someone with their hand raised, just turn around. Go stand by them and pray for them. Or hold your hands high. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. Father, I thank you that you didn't leave us. Lord, in the midst of the sifting, in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the rough of life, you are bound yourself to us and you're praying for us. Right now in heaven, you are lifting your voice, speaking with a real tongue and a real mouth to your Father's ears. You have all the attention of the Father right before you. And He's praying for you in this very moment that your faith would not fail. He didn't say you're not going to stumble, but He did say your faith is not going to fail you. So I ask, Father, would you strengthen these through the Holy Spirit, strengthen their faith, strengthen the grace that you have upon their life, 
Pour out a deeper measure of grace, Holy Spirit, the helper. Come and help. Come and help, Jesus. Sometimes the only thing we can say is help. And the Father knows exactly what He means because the helper's inside of you. Lord, and for those who don't feel sifted, I ask that you would help them to strengthen their brethren. Help us to be a witness to who you are. A witness to who you are, Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you guys are free to go about fellowship, commune, talk with each other, and uh, enjoy your week. If you want more and you're a glutton for punishment and you want more, come back next week. You got me again. If you didn't like it, then skip next week and my dad will be back the following week.